Hello and welcome to the Roland GR30 Video Owner's Manual. This video contains all of the information that you need to get up and running quickly and efficiently. So without further ado, let's begin. My guitar is fitted with the GK2A divided pickup, just here. Now this sends six audio signals to the GR30 for processing. Over here we find the control unit. We have a synth volume control. We have a switch which allows us to select synth, guitar, or a mixture of the two. Over here we see two switches, S1 and S2. These can be assigned to do various functions. And over here we see a small interconnection lead. This takes the ordinary guitar output from the ordinary guitar socket into the control unit. It can then be sent down one cable along with the divided pickup signal. And then in the GR30 it can either be split away and processed separately or mixed in with the synth sound. Okay, well when fitting the pickup there are a few things you need to bear in mind. Firstly, the pickup needs to be placed as close to the bridge as possible and you should find you have enough room between the bridge and the first pickup to accommodate the divided pickup. Okay, we also need to ensure that the pickup is as close to the strings as possible and in your GK2A kit you'll find a gauge and we can use this to gauge the spacing and what we're looking for is about one millimeter of clearance when fretting at the 12th fret on the guitar. It's important that we get as close to the strings as this since this is where the string excursion is at a minimum and we need maximum separation for the GR30 to be able to track the sounds in the most efficient way. Okay, well, you have a choice of mounting techniques. You can either use the screws, as I have here, and under each screw, a spring can be fitted. This allows us to slowly adjust the height of the pickup after it's been installed. Or you can use the sticky back spacers provided. And finally, the control unit can be attached using these sticky pads. Okay, well, bear in mind that the GK2A will not function correctly with nylon strings, gut strings, 12-string guitars, or bass guitars. Starting with the rear panel, first we see the AC inlet socket. Underneath this, you'll see a cable grip. Now, this is very handy as it will stop the cable accidentally being removed during performance. Next to this, we have the power switch, followed by the MIDI in and out sockets. These are very handy if we want to connect the GR30 up with external MIDI devices, such as a sound module or maybe a guitar processor. Next, we see the GK in socket. This is where we attach our 13-pin GK lead. Next to that, we have the expression pedal input. Now, we can hook up a Roland EV5 or similar expression pedal, and this allows us to control various parameters within the sound during live performance. Next, we see the bank shift socket. Now, don't be confused by this. This is actually a stereo socket, which means we can use a splitter lead to connect up to two momentary action foot switches, such as the Boss FS5U, to give us control, direct control, that is, over the particular bank. Next, you see the guitar return and guitar out sockets. Now, if these sockets are not used, you'll find that the direct guitar signal as sent down the 13-pin cable, is mixed with the main synth output. If you do choose to use the sockets, then this guitar signal will be split apart from the main synth output, allowing you to process it separately or maybe feed your traditional amplifier setup. And finally, we have the mix outputs, left and right. Now, you can see on the front panel, we have phones marked. These sockets can actually be used as two stereo headphone sockets. But bear in mind that if you're using headphones, then the the remaining output cannot be used as a line output. And also bear in mind that the phase of the headphone output will be different for each of the headphones used. Left and right will be reversed. OK, well, let's talk about the amplification that you might be using. I would recommend that you use full range amplification, such as a PA system or maybe even a keyboard amplifier. It even sounds great through your hi-fi. Guitar amps I would not recommend since they do not have a flat frequency response. And since some of the sounds contained within the GL30 require a flat frequency amplification, such as pianos, strings, and so on, that's what I'd go for. Now, for the purposes of this videotape, we're recording the audio in mono. 
And if you're using a mono setup, then there's one thing you must do before you start to play around with the sounds. Turn off the unit and turn it on again whilst holding down pedal number one. And you'll see the display shows mono. Now this is important since some of the patches actually use a stereo image. Some of the sounds, some of the tones within the patches are panned left and right. By initializing the unit in this way, we can make everything central so that what comes out of the left and right outputs is identical. Now at the top of the front panel, we see the display area shown here. Starting on the left-hand side, these five LEDs here function in various ways. When we're in tuner mode, they show us whether we're sharp or flat. When we're in play mode, they show us the status of the particular patch. They will also function when helping to set up various system settings, such as the sensitivity. Next to this, we have a numeric indication of group, bank, and number. This relates to the organization of the patches within the machine, and we'll talk in detail about those later on. And over here, we have three buttons. These are used when editing to confirm various parameter selections and to change the values for those parameters. Now, Roland have incorporated a very, very user-friendly uh, editing interface over here. Using these two large dials here, we can target various parameter areas and then home in on the particular parameter within that group using this control. Over here, we see the master volume control. This not only changes the output level of the synth sounds, but also the guitar sound as directed from the mix outputs when we're not using the guitar out and return sockets. Down here, we have the string select knob. This allows us to target individual strings for particular edits. And finally, down here, we see four pedals. These allow us to access patches with our feet during a live performance, for example. Alternatively, we can access the pedal effects shown above each of the pedals, wah, pitch glide, hold, arpeggiator, harmonist. We also use the pedals when editing, for example, when creating an arpeggio pattern. Once again, this will all be looked into deeply later on. OK, well, we're nearly ready to sound check the GL30. But before we do that, we have to make one very critical setting within the system area. We need to adjust the string sensitivity for each string individually in order to suit your own particular playing style. Now, to do that, we need to first access the system area. So let me show you how you do this. Look at your parameter select knob over here and rotate it until you see the notch points towards pickup sensitivity. That's the parameter selected. In order to now go into what is known as the edit mode to adjust that parameter, we press the button marked edit play. And the display reads 4 7. We'll try playing the guitar one string at a time, and you'll see that the display shows on the left hand side the particular string number first, second, third, fourth, and so on. And next to it is shown the sensitivity setting for that particular string. You may also notice that on the left-hand side of the display, over here, the small LEDs are now functioning as a bar graph meter. If I play gently, I can light just the first couple of LEDs. As I increase my picking strength, the meter shows an increased deflection. Now, the idea is that when I'm playing the string as hard as I'm likely to at any stage, I just cause that little last LED to light. Now, if it turns red, it means you're, you're probably just overshooting a little bit, which is exactly what I'm doing. So I need to reduce my string sensitivity just a little bit for the top E string. And to do that, I use these buttons here, plus and minus. Let's just take it down a couple of notches. Play gently, play hard, as hard as I'm going to. And I just like that last LED, and it just blinks red. That's about right, I think. Let's try the next string. That's about right. Now, that one seems a little bit weak, so I'm going to increase the value just by one step. That's about right. D string. Again, increase the value. Now, incidentally, when you're editing, rather than using the plus and minus buttons here, we can also use the S1 and S2 switches on the GK2A. Just like that, you can see the display change. And this will work for any parameter value. Now, the great thing about this particular setting is that it only has to be made once. If you switch the unit off and then on again, you'll find that those settings have been retained. Supposing, however, that you're using two or three different guitars, each equipped with the GK2A pickup. These guitars are likely to require different sensitivity settings. Well, that's fine, not a problem, because the GR30 can store up to four 
different groups of sensitivity settings. If we rotate the dial here, parameter select, all the way around, to where it says guitar select, you can see the display shows guitar number one. If I increase the value, I can select guitar two, three, and four, and make completely independent string settings for each of those four guitars. And once again, they are retained indefinitely. So there's one last job to do. We need to tune the guitar, because despite popular belief, the guitar really must be in tune when operating the GR30. It won't respond correctly unless the guitar is in tune. Before we audition the sounds in the GR30, let's quickly use the built-in tuner. Now, we can access the tuner in various ways, but the easiest is to go to the front panel and hold down the edit play button along with the minus button. You'll notice a little arrow connects the two. So we first press edit play and then add minus, and the display reads one dot. Well, that is referring to the string number on the guitar once again. String one, two, three, and so on. When I play the top E, the note E is shown in the display. F. F sharp, G. So the unit is automatically detecting the note that I'm playing and will tune to that note. On the left-hand side of the display, the LEDs now function as sharp, flat indication. And you can see as I increase the tuning of the top E string, the LEDs show me either sharp or flat. When bang on, the central LED will light red. And then I'm in tune. And I just simply move down to the other strings and do exactly the same thing. There we are. A bit flat on the A. And also on the A. Good, I'm in tune. To exit the tuner mode, simply press the edit play button. And we go back to the play mode. I'm now ready to listen to some of the built-in sounds. We're now ready to sound check. In order to avoid possible damage to your equipment, it's important that you switch each unit on in the correct order. Start with your amplifier, then turn on the GR30, but before you do that, make sure that its master volume control is set all the way to the minimum position. This avoids bumps and thumps when we switch on. Turn on, and you can see that the display takes a couple of seconds to, uh, to reach the play mode, showing A11 in the display. This is simply the name of the currently selected patch, I will explain exactly what a patch is in just a moment. Next, increase the master volume, all the way to maximum. Moving to the GK2A, check that your synth volume control is up, and that your guitar mix synth selector is set to either mix or synth. If you switch it to guitar, then you won't actually hear any synth when you play. Now, having turned on the GR30, we move automatically to that first patch, A11, and if you play the guitar, you should now hear some sound. If you don't hear anything, check your connections. The basic sound unit within the GR30 is known as a patch, and we can scroll through the various patches available using the increment decrement buttons here. If I hold down the one mark plus, I move swiftly upwards through the various patches available and downwards by holding down negative. Okay, well you can see there that the group is displayed as a letter. Groups A, B, C, D, and so on, all the way up to H. And each group contains eight banks. Each bank contains four patch numbers. Now incidentally, when you're scrolling through, you can move more swiftly by holding down first the key in the direction you wish to go, and then the opposite number. Kind of like a turbo scroll. There we go. Now, groups A, B, C, and D are the user group areas. These are memory locations in which you can store your own sound settings. However, groups E, F, G, and H are the factory groups. The sounds contained in these groups cannot actually be altered permanently. Their references, if you like. It is possible, however, to modify them and then store them within the user group areas. Okay, well, how do we access these patches when we're performing in a live situation? It's also possible to select the patches using the switches built into the GK2A, S1 and S2. 
Now, under normal circumstances, these won't function in that way. However, if we rotate the parameter select dial all the way around to where it says patch increment decrement by S1 and S2, we can now utilize these controls moving upwards and downwards through the various patches. And we even have our turbo scroll available. If I hold down S2 and then add S1, we move very quickly through the range of available patches and likewise downwards, as you see there. OK, so we have eight groups of eight banks of four patches. That makes a total of 256 different patches. Well, that's not strictly true, because what we have here is 128 patches that have been duplicated. You'll find that the sounds contained within banks E through to H are exactly the same as those contained A through to D. Simple duplication. But remember, those A through to D can be adjusted and saved, whereas E through to H are permanent, unchangeable. You'll find a comprehensive listing of all of the available patches and their associated names on the back page of the owner's manual. Now bear in mind that when you're listening to the patches, the position of these controls is irrelevant. They will not affect the sound in any way. Simply adjust the parameter select control to patch increment decrement by S1 and S2 if you happen to be using the switches on the GK2 to select your patches. Other than that, it really doesn't matter. Once you've had a chance to listen to some of the patches, you may well have found one or two that you'd like to use in a particular situation. Well, one neat trick is to be able to reorganize the sounds and group them together within your first bank, for example, so that you could have your four favorite sounds available directly within that one bank. To do that, we need to master the patch write command. OK, well, I've got two sounds here. Patch E14 is the sitar. And in E22, I have a pipe sound. I want to try and group those together so that they're next to each other in group A, bank one. And this is how we do it. Select the first patch. Rotate the parameter select dial until you see write two. Which patch do we want to write this sound into? Press edit play, and the display shows A11. This is our destination memory location. And that happens to be the one I want to put it in. So that's fine. I then rotate the dial to where it says patch right yes or no, the display flashes asking me to confirm that that is indeed the correct memory location. And to confirm, I simply hold down minus followed by plus. And you can see that those two buttons are joined together with a little word yes, minus, plus. And the display shows done. And that A11 patch memory location should now be my electric sitar. And of course it is. Let's go back and do the second patch now which, if you remember, was E22. Once again, parameter select, right 2. Edit play, A11. Well, no, that's where our sitar is. We want to select a different patch. So, in this case, value up just one notch to A12. Is that now the correct location? Yes, it is. Rotate the dial to right patch, and then confirm by holding down minus, and then plus. And that should be the pipe sound. And now, you'll find that they're right next to each other. Exactly where we want them. So that's great. In this example, I've organized four sounds into group A, bank three. Sound number one is this one, string sound. That's fine. Moving on. Organ sound. 33 is an electric piano. And finally, in A34, I have an acoustic piano. Well, unfortunately, the organ sound is a little bit too quiet for my purposes. OK, when I select the sound, I can always adjust the volume using my GK2 volume control, but it would be nicer if I could actually bring it in at the correct level in the first place. So let's go back to that sound. A32. I need to make an adjustment to the patch common level. And to do that, we go into edit mode. Hit the edit play button. 
rotate the edit target knob all the way around to where we see common. This is patch common. Now, once we've targeted common, we find we actually have four options within this area. A, B, C, and D. Patch level, play feel, pan, chromatic. Well, we need to target parameter A. And to do that, we simply rotate the parameter select knob all the way around until A is selected. The display then automatically shows us the value for that parameter, in this case, 30. Now, by increasing that value, I can increase the patch level, either using these controls here or using S1 and S2 on the guitar, like that. So let's raise that value. Let's try that. Well, that's a much better value, so I'm going to now rewrite that patch into location A32. So once again, rotate this dial, right to... Well, that happens to be correct, A32, since it was the original patch location anyway. Patch right and confirm by pressing minus and plus together. Done. And you'll now find that the patches are at a more equal or balanced level. And so on. Two additional things that you need to know about the right procedure. Firstly, when you're writing from one patch memory location to another, you are in fact making a duplicate or a copy of the original. The source location still contains that patch. It doesn't disappear. Okay, the other thing to bear in mind, and a word of warning here, if you copy to a destination memory location, it will overwrite everything that was originally in that location. So be careful. Make sure that you don't copy over some of the previously edited sounds. As we saw earlier, to enter the edit mode, we press the edit play button. Now this is common to all edits. You'll notice that the LED over here, shown underneath the word edit, lights green. This shows us that we are in fact in the edit mode. And at this point, we can make any amount of changes to the patch that we want. Bear in mind that these changes are not permanent. They are made permanent only when we write the patch to memory. So at this point, we can experiment, change a couple of parameter values. If you want to abort the edit and return to the original sound, simply press the edit play button once more. At this point, you'll notice that the edit LED flashes red. This is showing us that although we are currently with A11, we're going to be hearing the edited version of that sound. Okay, to return it to the original, simply reselect the patch. And that will take us back to the original version of A11. This is common for all edits. We saw earlier that the basic sound unit is the patch. Well, the patch is actually made up of yet more fundamental units called tones, and up to two tones can be combined to form the patch. Some of the patches use just one tone, others use two. Well, you'll find a listing in the manual of all of the available tones, up to 384 of them, in fact. Here's a basic patch, E72. Well, I know that this consists of just one single tone, and to view the tone number, we go into edit mode. Press the edit play button, now, edit target, first tone. And we want to view the tone number, which is shown to be parameter A. So rotate the parameter select knob round to A, and you can see the display reads number one, which is the basic piano waveform. But I can change that. Let's have a look at, uh, let's say, uh, 109. Looking at my listing in the manual, I can see that this is a TB303 bass sound. <laughs> Seventy-nine is a banjo sound. Scroll down to that. Okay, so you can change the piano sound into any other instrument that you happen to have a waveform or tone for. And since we have 384 to choose from, you'll probably find just about everything in there. Once again, if you don't like the change, edit, change patch, and that will return E72 back to the piano. If you like the change, then write it into memory. This is how we combine two tones to form a layered patch. My goal is to create a piano and string layer. OK, well, starting with my basic piano patch, E72, I can start to modify the sound. Let's go into edit. Edit target, first tone, tone number, parameter A. 
OK, that's tone number one. That's fine. That's what I'm going to use for my first tone anyway. Rotating around to the second tone, I can see a tone number shown of 93. Well, I know that my string sound is 293. So let's just select that. That's there. If I now play the guitar, I still only hear piano. So what's gone wrong? Well, nothing. We just have to make a further refinement. Turn around to where you see tone mix for the edit target. And you can see at the top here, parameter A is shown as layer. A dash one. What does this mean? Well, the A means all strings. It is actually possible to select individual strings for individual edits. And the string select knob, as you can see, is rotated all the way around to where it says all for all strings. A dash one. This means that tone number one is being applied to all strings. And we can change this. Perhaps we want to apply tone number two to all strings. Or both. A dash B. Well, this is exactly what we need. There are two other options here. There's detune and a stronger detune. This is handy when you try to combine two tones that are actually the same tone, but you put one slightly out of tune with the first, giving you a nice chorusy, spacious effect. But we're going to go for A dash B. Both tones assigned to all strings. And if we now play the guitar, we hear piano and strings. It's also possible to change the relative balance between the two tones. And you can see there, parameter D is marked 1, 2, balance. Let's have a look at that. Well, this is at the moment set to 0, but this can be biased in one of two directions. Minus 50 gives us just tone 2. Plus 50 gives us just tone 1. So I'm going to look for a setting at around plus 30, I think, for my particular balance. And that's about right. I've created the patch. I now have to write it into memory. So, rotate the dial. Write to... OK, let's put it into A11. Patch write and confirm. Minus, plus. And that's permanently stored. And of course it will be remembered even when the machine's switched off. It's also possible to create a split patch whereby certain tones are assigned to certain strings. Here's an example of that. You can see there that I have a piano sound assigned to the top four strings, leaving a bass sound for the bottom two. OK, well, here's how I made it. Let's once again start with our basic piano sound at E72. Just check that. OK, into the edit mode. We're going to select for tone one, Number 14, which is the electric piano. For tone number two, I've got a bass sound at 102. There we go. Around to tone mix. Now, it's possible here to assign different parameters for different strings. Let's rotate the knob all the way around until we see 6, 5. Now, these are the bottom two strings on the guitar, and the display shows L-1. This means that at the moment, the lower two strings on the guitar have been assigned to tone number one. Well, that's wrong, because tone number one is the electric piano, so let's change that to tone number two. All of the remaining strings, four, three, two, and one, need to be left assigned to tone one. And we should hear now that we have the split that we need. But unfortunately, the balance isn't quite right. I think the bass needs to come up a bit. So, rotating round, to parameter D, and we'll bias in favour, I think, of the bass. Well, that's actually increased the level of the electric piano, so we need to go down into the negative regions. Let's try this one. I think that's right. It's possible to change the tuning of each of the individual strings on the guitar in semitone steps without actually having to retune the guitar itself. I've got a simple patch that I've put together here using a single tone acoustic guitar sound. What I'd like to create for patch A12 exactly the same sound, but this time using an open major tuning. OK, so let's go into the edit mode. And we're going to target the tone mix once again with the edit target knob. Transposition of the first tone, which is parameter B, 
and we can select for each individual string a transposition. So for a major chord, I need to shift the third string up by one semitone, the fourth string up by two semitones, likewise with the fifth, and leave the sixth unaffected. If I now play the open strings on the guitar, you should hear a major chord. Here's another interesting effect using the transpose facility. I'm going to try and convert the sound of my six string acoustic into that of a 12 string. Okay, so just starting with my basic six string sound. I'm going to go and double up the tones. So add into the second tone area the same tone that I have in the first, which is in fact 57. Okay, now let's layer the two tones together. So to layer, I'm going to select for all strings, both. Now, that isn't really what's going on with a 12-string guitar. The top two strings are tuned in unison with a slight detuning effect. So for strings number one and two, I'm going to select D for detune. And then finally, I have to shift the bottom four strings up one whole octave for tone number two. So transposition of the second tone, which is parameter C, for the bottom four strings is going to be plus 12 semitones. And finally, on the third string. Let's just check the relative balance between the two tones. Well, I'm going to set this to zero so that they're just about equal. And that should give me a 12-string tuning. The GR30 contains some synthesis controls, and they can be found over here. Attack, release, and brightness. And these can be adjusted independently for each of the two tones. Well, let's look at the attack. This is actually attack time, and it's simply the time taken for the sound to reach its loudest possible point after the note has been struck. Here's a basic single tone string sound. Let's go in and adjust the attack time. For tone one, parameter B. Well, if I increase this value, I get a much slower attack sound kind of fades in. Or if I reduce it, I can create a much more instantaneous transient, as it's known. OK, let's set that back to zero. The release time is also adjustable. Now, this allows the sound to decay naturally after the strings have been let go. So if I increase this value, take my hand away, and the sound decays naturally. Okay. The brightness is also adjustable. This is a simple tone control affecting the tone. If I reduce this to zero, we get a duller sound. And I can go all the way to minus 50, rolling off a lot of the treble frequencies. And once again, these three settings can be made independently for each of the tones in a patch. In addition to the master string sensitivity settings that we made earlier on, each patch also contains its own independent string sensitivity settings. This is called the play feel. Now, it's possible that for one patch, you'd like to use a finger picking technique, and for another patch, maybe use a plectrum. Clearly, the string sensitivity settings need to be different for each of the patches. Well, we have various options. Let's go and have a look. Into the edit mode, let's target common, and we're going to look for Parameter B, play feel. So rotate round until we see B. And we have various options here. Now, NOR, that stands for normal. This is the normal string sensitivity that most of the patches in the GR30 are set up to use. We have the option to use finger picking. This just means that we have a slightly more sensitive response. And this is ideal for classical guitar sounds or certain other guitar sounds that would normally be picked. For example, patch E52. This is a classical guitar sound with a little bit of strings behind it. gives a much more even response using the finger-picking technique. What else have we got? Well, there's a hard setting. If you're a bit heavy-handed, you can select the hard setting. This means that the, uh, the whole patch will be slightly less sensitive to your playing. 
and the opposite of that, soft. So you can play very gently and get the full dynamic range. Tap. Well, this is utilized for certain styles of electric guitar playing, tapping styles. For example, here's a patch. Using the tap setting, we can create a much more even response when using tapping techniques, like this. OK, what else do we have? Next, we see no dynamics. This will give us no volume change for different picking strengths. This is ideal for organ sounds and other instruments that aren't velocity sensitive. Next, we see EF1 and EF2. This stands for envelope follow one envelope follow two. And these are slightly different. Let's experiment with EF1. Now there's one patch in the machine already which uses this and you'll find it at E82. It's a kind of clav sound. And you can hear that the decay of the sound follows exactly the decay of the guitar string. So if you're using a guitar with a lot of sustain then the synth sound will have more sustain. A guitar with very little sustain will give a synth sound with very little sustain. It literally follows the guitar envelope, which means it can be very, very expressive using the guitar envelope sound. The alternative to that is to use EF2. This is exactly the same idea, but rather than changing the, the volume of the sound with the guitar envelope, it literally changes the brightness of the sound. And another example of that is F74. Once again, you'll find this in your machine. This is a lead sound. If I play hard, it's nice and bright, but if I choose to play a bit softer, I can make the sound speak. Now, this is very, very handy. If it's used in conjunction with the auto wire effect in the effects section, which we'll look at later on, you can really, really have that kind of touch wire sound. You may have noticed that some of the patches in the GR30 work chromatically and others allow for the use of pitch bend and whammy bar and vibrato and so on. Well, you have a choice. You can set up for the chromatic to be on or off. The basic piano sound at E72 uses the chromatic facility and it will quantize the pitch of the note to the nearest semitone as you bend the note, which is completely appropriate for a piano sound since pianos do not have pitch bend. Let's try another sound. F22 is a, a kind of flute sound. And you can hear that that bends nicely. Well, we have three options for the chromatic mode. So let's go and have a look. Edit target, patch common once again. And this time we're going to go to D, chromatic. And it says off. OK, but well, we know it's off. Three options, on one, on two, on three. What are the differences? Well, let's see if you can hear the differences. OK, the pitch is being quantized to semitone steps, but we only get the transient of the sound once. This is good for simulating trill effects on the pipes. On two is slightly different. You can hear there that as the note is quantized in pitch, it also re-triggers. This is appropriate for keyboard sounds like pianos, organs, and so on. But the note still decayed naturally along with the string. On three is different once again. Re-triggering, but you may notice that the volume of each subsequent note remains at the initial string plucked strength. OK, so rather than decaying naturally, it remains constant until the string stops vibrating. The two tones of the patch can be panned, either left or right, or anywhere in between, to create a wide stereo spread. Now, bear in mind, of course, that you will only hear this if you're working in stereo. And since we're recording in mono, I can't really demonstrate the effect. But I'll, uh, I'll show you the various settings available. Once again, in the patch common area, this time we look for parameter C, pan. And we can move the whole patch, either hard left, central, or hard right, or anywhere in between. OK. We also have the option to pan the individual strings to different points within the stereo sound field. In this case, one to six, moving from left to right as we move down through the strings. Or right to left. Here we have odd and even, which means the strings will be panned left and right, alternately, left, right, left, right, left, right, and so on. Or once again, the other way around. 
We can also set up a random pan for the whole patch, which means that every note that's played will appear in a random position. And we can also target the random effect just for the first tone or just the second tone, leaving the other tone centrally panned. And then we have alternate notes. These will be panned hard left and hard right alternately. So just playing one string, these sounds are panning left and right. And then once again, we can apply that effect just to tone one, just to tone two. So that's tone pan. The GR30 contains two effects processors, one giving us reverb effects and the other giving us chorus effects. Patch H84 has an interesting sound on it. This is a delay. Now it's possible to switch off globally the effects for the entire machine. And to do that, we go to the front panel. And you can see, if we hold down Edit Play and the Plus button, the two are joined by Effect On Stroke Bypass. Press them together and you can hear that the delay effect is removed, leaving just the arpeggiator. And once again, back on. And the status of the effect is shown up here. This LED under Effect Bypass lights when the effects are switched off. OK, well, the effects types available are shown in this area here, marked effect. So I'm going to go back to uh, my first patch, which is a simple Strat sound that I've set up. Into edit mode. Effect. OK, first of all, we have the reverb effect. At the moment, this is switched off. Targeting parameter A, we can select the reverb type. And we have various simulations. Room 1, 2, and 3. Hall 1, 2, and 3. And Plate. These are just simulations of different reverb types. And select the particular algorithm that is appropriate for the tone. They vary slightly. The hall generates the sound of a large space. The room generates the sound of a much smaller space. This is what the hall one sounds like. <laughs> We can adjust the level of the reverb. This is parameter B, and I can set that to a maximum of 100, giving a much wetter sound. And we can also change the reverb time, which is parameter C. This we can extend, once again, all the way up to a maximum of 100, which gives us a very long decay. Or down to a much shorter decay. Okay. We also have alternative settings. Delay 1, delay 2, delay 3, and 4, and so on. These are simple echo effects, each one offering uh, a different degree of feedback, that is, the number of repeats available. But we can still use parameter B, the reverb level, to change the delay level, and so on. And finally, we have panning delays. Once again, these only work when in stereo, but each delay is panned left and right alternately. OK, let's just switch the reverb off. We also have chorus effects, and we can view the chorus type in parameter D. At the moment, it's switched off. Once again, just listen to the chord. No effect. Chorus. It adds a subtle modulation to the sound and gives us a much richer effect. And we also have a choice of chorus types. These vary in tone and effect. So once again, pick the correct one for the tones you happen to use. There's also a flanger option, which is a much more intense chorus effect using a bit of feedback. You can hear that. The manual lists the variations between the effects, so check them out. We also have the option to use a couple of slapback delays, short delay one all the way through to short delay six, and two special effects, SE1 <coughs> and a kind of comb filter that's great for sitar effects.
Let's take a closer look at the built-in pedals. Well, obviously, these can be used for patch selection, but alternatively, we can use what's known as the pedal effect mode. Let's take a look above each pedal. Here we have wah, pitch glide, hold, or sustain, and then arpeggiator, or harmonist. These are the effects that can be triggered manually on the fly using the pedals, but only when we're in pedal effect mode. And to access that mode, we can do one of two things. Either press S2 on the GK2A, and you see there we can toggle between the normal mode and the pedal effect mode, as the display indicates. Just like that. Alternatively, if you rotate the parameter select dial all the way around to its most clockwise position, it puts us permanently into pedal effect mode. OK? Well, once in pedal effect mode, we can start experimenting with the effects. Now, every patch in the GR30 has a different set of pedal effects, and I'll show you how to set these up later on. But experimenting with patch F82, there's my basic sound. So let's try pressing pedal 1. Well, that's the wire effect. Pedal 2 is a pitch glide. Pedal 3 is hold or sustain. Now, this means I can play a chord and then release my fingers from the guitar and the chord will carry on sustaining. Take my hand off the guitar and the chord continues until I release the pedal. And finally, the arpeggiator. Now, pedal 4 will not only activate the arpeggiator, it will also activate the harmonist if it is harmonist that's switched on within the patch. And you can tell whether we're using harmonist or arpeggiator looking at this LED here. Let's switch the effect on once more, and you can see it lights up green. Well, if this patch actually was using harmonist instead of arpeggiator, it would light up red. Let's take a look at how we can edit the pedal effects on a given patch. Starting with A11 here, which is a sawtooth pad. Let's go into the edit mode and select from the foot pedal target parameter A, which is wah wah. OK, and we can see a list of available wah types. WA1, that stands for wah one. WA2, 3, 4, and 5. These are all wah types, and they're identical except for the fact that as we go through the list, the rise time and fall time increases. Much slower. Next, we see auto wah. So the wah is triggered by the playing dynamics. And once again, we can change the envelope of the wah. Much slower wah. BR, this stands for brightness. Similar to wire, except this time all we're doing is changing the brightness dynamically. Then we have narrow wire. This is a much more narrow version of the original wire sound. So its range has been reduced. Then we see the opposite of what we've had already. This is, if you like, an inverse version of the wire sound. just working in the opposite direction so that it closes when you press the pedal rather than opening. And all of the other settings are duplicated in their reverse form. And finally, we have modulation. And this will function differently depending on the kind of tones contained within the patch. So that's the wah-wah. There are 18 different pitch glide effects to choose from, OK? There's a basic pad sound. You'll find this at E24. Let's have a look at the options. Into edit, parameter B this time, glide type. And you can see there that there are nine different types of downward pitch glide. And they all sound different. consisting of different glide speeds and different glide widths. And we also have nine upward glides, very handy for pedal steel guitar effects.
Now the hold facility is particularly useful on a guitar synth as it allows you to sustain chords, then maybe play other sounds over the top, or maybe just make it easier to move between chords. Now, if you're a pianist, you would rely very heavily on your sustained pedal. So when you're using a piano sound from the GR30, you would expect to be able to do the same. These are the different types of hold available. Parameter C in this case shows us the hold type, and the first is DPR, that stands for damper, and it works in exactly the same way as a piano damper pedal, in that every note that's played is sustained even when the note is released, like this. Next we have the option to apply the damper effect just to one of the two tones, tone one alone or tone two, leaving the other tone unaffected. We can also choose to apply the effect just to any externally connected MIDI sound module, leaving the internal sounds unaffected. We can add the effect just to tone one plus external MIDI module, tone two plus external MIDI module. So every conceivable combination has been catered for. Now this is SOS, this stands for sostenuto. This is a different kind of hold effect. So you can hear there that once the pedal is pressed, only those strings that were vibrating at the time are sustained, leaving those strings that were not unplayable. This is quite handy as it means you can play a chord on the guitar, fade up the original guitar sound and play over the top. Great fun. Next we have the option to apply the sostenuto once again just to tone one or tone two, or the externally connected MIDI device. And then finally we have STR. This is a special kind of sustain called string, and it sounds like this. You can see there that various strings can be sustained, leaving the unsustained strings active to carry on playing over the top. The GR30 contains a unique arpeggiator function. This is demonstrated particularly well by the patch E21, and we can see that the arpeggiator feature is used because the LED shown here is lit green. Remember, it would be lit red for the harmonist function. Well, this uses two acoustic guitar tones, one panned right, one panned left. One of them strums and one of them arpeggiates automatically. Just try playing simple chords. <laughs> OK, well, each patch in the GR30 can contain its own arpeggio figure, and you're free to write whatever kind of motif you want. Let's move to a more basic guitar sound, and I'll show you how to construct your own. So here we are, the standard acoustic. One tone used in this case. Well, let's have a look at the arpeggio parameters. Edit target, arpeggio, parameter select, A. And you can see a list of options here, ARP, arpeggio. Well, that will generate arpeggio information for both tones one and tone two, plus any externally connected MIDI sound module. But we have a choice to change that to just tone one, tone two, just the two tones, or just the external module, or combinations of the two ideas. 
So set that back to ARP, arpeggio, and we're ready to input our arpeggio idea at this point using the pedals here. We have begin, end, tie, enter, rest, and to top. So I'll press pedal one, and I can now play each of the strings of the motif separately, and these will be entered one step at a time into the machine. So let's take a simple D chord and start entering our arpeggio. And of course, you can do this as quickly or as slowly as you like. And that's the end of my arpeggio. You can see that the display was changing, incrementing by one step every time I played and then damped the appropriate string. So I finished entering the data, so I then press pedal one again. And we see ARP once more. Now, what happens if I play that chord? It automatically arpeggiates. Now, as you're entering the data, you have the choice to tie notes over or to enter rest notes. And if you make a mistake, you can always go straight back to the top of the figure just by pressing this pedal four to top. Once the arpeggio has been recorded, you can then play any chords you like, and the GR30 will automatically fit the appropriate notes to the arpeggio. We can even change some of the features of the arpeggio after it's been recorded. If you look at parameter B, we can change the duration of the notes. At the moment, this is set to 16th notes, but I can reduce that all the way to quarter notes. Or eighth notes. And you can even apply a certain shuffle feel. Low shuffle, high shuffle. Which will not only change the duration of the notes, but also the relative levels of the notes. Eighth note triplets. And so on. Let's just set that back to 16. We can also change the duration of the notes. At the moment, I think my arpeggio figure is a little bit stilted, a bit too staccato for my liking. So I can increase that value. So it's a bit smoother. Alternatively, I can go all the way down 30% of the original value. And the maximum setting is full. Now, this is quite interesting. as It means each string is sustained until that string is played once again. Let's just set that back to uh, 80, where it was originally. And finally, we can alter the tempo of the arpeggio. Let's just reduce it slightly. Increase. And if you like, you can use pedal number four as a tap tempo feature. You can see the display shows tap. It's now automatically changing the BPM, the tempo of the arpeggio, according to my pedal pushes. And it takes an average of four pushes to get the correct value. So you can easily synchronize the BPM or tempo of your arpeggio with some external source. OK, one last feature of the tempo is that it can be synced, SYN, to MIDI clock information. Now, if you're using a drum machine or MIDI sequencer, it's possible to automatically sync the arpeggio to that incoming data so that the two units run exactly in time. An alternative pattern input method is the real-time method. This allows you to input patterns in a way that resembles making a recording on a tape recorder. Let's experiment with this real-time method by first calling up patch E53. Make sure the edit target knob is set to arpeggio then take a look at the parameters. The arpeggio rhythm is set to straight 16th notes as shown for parameter B. Let's leave this. Set the duration to about 80. And finally set the tempo to about 60. Now press pedal 1 while the parameter select dial is set to either C or D and you'll hear a metronome. The display shows G.16, which means that the arpeggio pattern is 16 sixteenth notes, or one bar in length. This can be changed at this point using the value buttons. We're now ready for real-time entry. Press pedal 2, 
and the display begins to count down and the metronome you'll hear becomes accented. Begin playing at G01 to record the pattern. When you finish playing, press pedal number one to stop the metronome and return to the normal edit mode. Strike a chord to check the results. If you make a mistake during pattern input, simply wait for the pattern to loop around again, as any further strings played will write over those recorded on the previous cycle. Finally, don't forget to write the patch to memory if you want to store the arpeggio. Have a listen to patch E12. This combines two guitar sounds, tone one and tone two. Tone two, however, is targeted with the internal intelligent harmonist, giving us real-time harmony in the key of C. In this particular case, up one third. The display shows us that the harmonist is in fact switched on, and we can view the harmonist parameters by going into edit mode. Of course, the arpeggio and the harmonist share the same section in the edit target area, so this time we're viewing the parameters shown in the right-hand column. Parameter A is the harmony select, and we can decide whether to target tone 1, tone 2, both, any external MIDI sound module, or a combination of those ideas. So let's put that back to uh, targeting the second tone. Next, we can choose the harmony interval, in this case, one third. And in the key of C, that's going to be a major third up. But I can increase that to a perfect fourth, fifth, and so on. We've even got a diminished setting, so you can play diminished scales and create harmony from the diminished scale. Or you can go downwards in exactly the same way. But whatever happens, the harmony note generated will fit the key as specified by parameter C. C major is shown. I can select C sharp, D, and so on, through all the major keys, and then the minor keys, denoted by the dash, C minor, C sharp minor, and so on. So let's put that back to C. Now, a very handy trick here, when in pedal effect mode, you can use the upwards part of an external bank select pedal to change the key from major to minor. So if you watch the display as I press my Boss FS5U, it will switch from C, which is displayed, to the minor version, C minor, and so on. And I can take it back to the major just by pressing the button once more. So there we see major displayed, minor, and so on. Handy performance tool. Once again, editing, this time parameter D. H remote. Well, this allows us to use incoming MIDI note information to select the key. So as soon as the GL30 receives a note name, it will respond by changing the harmonist key to that note. Remember that to save permanently any arpeggio settings or harmonist settings, you must write the patch into memory. If you don't, then as soon as another patch is selected, all of that data will be lost. I've now plugged in my Roland EV5 expression pedal into the socket on the back of the GR30. Now, if you happen to be using one of these, ensure that the control on the side here is all the way to its most anti-clockwise position, as this gives us the greatest range. OK, well, the pedal can be used to target one of many parameters, and I've got a few examples set up here for you. E24, this gives us control over the pitch of the sound, directly from the pedal. Patch E31 gives us a wah effect. Patch E32 gives us control over the volume, so we can use it as a swell pedal. Without, and then with. Patch E83 gives us control over modulation.
add H83 allows us to both speed up and change the pitch of an arpeggio. Just like changing the speed of a piece of tape. Okay, well, let's look at some of the other settings available. Into edit, foot pedal, parameter D. And these are the choices. Straight volume control. Now, you can adjust the loudness of the first tone or the second tone independently. The balance between the two and there's a brightness control. This is the wire effect, so you've got a choice whether to trigger it from pedal one or from the expression pedal. The pitch control. Now, the, the settings will be dependent on those made in the glide section. Okay? Modulation. This is the left to right balance, so we can pan the whole patch using the pedal. Or we can reverse the settings made within the pan section, so that the first tone, if panned left, becomes right and the second tone if panned right becomes left, so they cross over. Okay, here we have the reverb level. And then three tempo controls. These allow us to modify the tempo from the patch tempo faster, patch tempo to slower, or plus or minus about 20% of the patch tempo speed. And then finally we have tempo and pitch combined, which is exactly what I used in that last example. We can also assign MIDI outputs to the pedal. In this case, we're selecting a MIDI controller number. So if you want to use your expression pedal contr to control the volume of an external MIDI unit, you might want to select MIDI controller 7, which is the standard volume controller as specified by the MIDI spec. And you've got all of the controllers available there, so it's totally user assignable. At any point, it's possible to return the GR30 to the state it was in when it was first taken out of the box. And this is known as the factory initialize. And to do that, you first turn the machine off. And then whilst holding down pedal number two, switch on. And then using the plus and minus buttons, we can select the area of memory to be initialized. Do we just want to reset the patch memories? Or the system area? Or both? Selecting INI, initialize, will reset the whole machine. Now, be warned, if you choose to do this, you will lose all of your system settings, and that means the string sensitivity settings that we made earlier on. But if you're happy with that, then press Edit, Play, and the display reads, are you sure you want to initialize? And to confirm, hold down minus, then plus. And after a couple of seconds, the machine says it's done. It's been initialized. Now, by using the guitar out and return jacks, we can incorporate an external effects processor, such as, in this case, the Boss GT5. This allows me to mix the sound from the GT5 in with the synth sound generated by the GR30. And, of course, I have the control for guitar, synth, or a mixture of the two here on the GK2A. So, for example, selecting just synth on its own, just guitar on its own, or a mixture of the two. And here's a neat little trick. We can sustain the synth sound, fading in the guitar over the top. Also very useful for instant octave sounds using a cleaner guitar sound and bass. Well, you can see that I've managed to hook up the two units together using a MIDI cable. I'm taking MIDI out from the GR30 to MIDI in on the GT5. And as I increase through the patches, you can see that the patches on the GT5 move in accordance. Okay, well this only works if you set the MIDI channel, the receive MIDI channel of the GT5 to be the same as the master channel of the GR30. So how do we do that? In order to select the system MIDI channel of the GR30, we need to go into the MIDI area, and that's down here. So, edit, target MIDI, and its parameter C. 
and this shows us the currently selected transmit channel. And it's important that we get this right. The GT5 is set up to receive on MIDI channel 3. So the GR30 must also transmit on MIDI channel 3, otherwise the program change information will not be correctly received or responded to. And we have a choice. We can change this to any of the 16 MIDI channels available. OK, so let's put that back to 3. Now let's once more check the hookup. I've got my MIDI out from the GR30 connected to the MIDI in on the GT5. The guitar out connected to the guitar input on the GT5, and the guitar return connected to the mono output of the GT5. Once you've made the hookup, you should find that the two units now work as one. OK. Well, one other word of warning. If you've uh, tried copying some of the patches across, you will find that each patch contains its own program change number. And this can be seen down here. Parameter A in the MIDI area. Let's have a look. And for example, this patch, when selected, will transmit the program change 1, and that will call up program number 1 on the GT5. However, because each patch on the GR30 contains its own program change number, which can be altered, you may find that you end up having copied patches from one location to another with a very chaotic stream of program change information. Well, we can initialize the program changes so that they run consecutively, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And this is how we do it. Switch off the machine, hold down pedal number two. And just as when we were initializing earlier on, we have the option here to initialize only the program change numbers, PG0. Hit edit play. Are you sure? And confirm by pressing negative, positive, and that's done. Now, as the Roland transmits all of its note, velocity, and pitch bend information from the MIDI out socket, it means we can hook up to an external sound source, such as the Roland JV2080 over here. Simply connect MIDI out to MIDI in. And this allows us to directly access the sounds in the external unit. I've selected a basic performance in the 2080. And by moving through the various patches in the GR30, I can select sounds. And the sounds are selected by the internal program change that's transmitted with every patch. So, for example, A71 gives me a nylon string guitar, but this time from the expander, not from the GR30. OK, but what are the various settings? Into edit mode. Edit target MIDI, and take a look at the, the channel, parameter C. This says 1.P. What does that mean? Well, it means that I'm transmitting on MIDI channel 1 polyphonically, which means all strings on the guitar are transmitting on MIDI channel 1. And I can change that to any of the other 16 MIDI channels. I can also change the program change number that happens to go out when I select that patch. Program change number 25 is the nylon guitar. 24 is an accordion. I can also adjust the bend range. Now, this is very important. It's very important that you set the transmission bend range, the pitch bend range, that is, to be the same as that of the receiving device. So go to your expander and set the bend range to 2, 12, or maybe 24, but make sure that the GR30 is set to the same. Otherwise, string bending will not be carried out correctly. OK, well, let's just go back to parameter C for a second. 1.p. Well, there's an alternative. We have MIDI channels 1 through to 11. These are the mono channels, monophonic transmission. Now, if I select 1, it means that my bottom E string is being transmitted on channel 1, but the next string up is being transmitted on channel 2. 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. Now, the idea here is that each string accesses a different part within the performance in the sound module. It means we can therefore assign different sounds for each string, or maybe just two different sounds, so we can create those lovely string split patches that we had earlier on. And of course, to make that easier, six independent program change commands can be transmitted, one for each string. Just up here, using the string select knob, decide which number you wish to have on each string. Simple as that. So when the patch is selected, you'll find the appropriate sounds are assigned to the correct strings. One last thing to look at, is transpose, which is parameter B. 
This allows us once again for each string to transpose, but this time just via MIDI. It won't have any effect on the internal sound source, just the external sound module. Using the MIDI bulk dump feature, the internal settings of one GR30 can be transferred to another. This is quite handy if you want to back up your data. Alternatively, you can record that MIDI data directly to a MIDI sequencer and maybe store it onto a disk. That can then be loaded back into the GR30 at any time. So what I have here is two identical units. I'm going to transfer the internal settings, that is, the user patches, plus the system settings, from this machine to this machine. And of course, we're really only copying from here to here. We're not going to lose the original settings in machine number one. So switch off the source machine and hold down pedal number three. OK, the display reads all. Well, I have a choice of transmitting all the internal data, or just the system data, or just the user patch data. Then I can select maybe just to transmit user patch group A, B, C, D, or individual patches. OK, well, I'm going to go back and select all in this case. Now, I have my MIDI out connected to MIDI in on the other machine. This unit is ready to receive system-exclusive data at any time, so I don't even have to touch this. But over here, I simply press Edit Play, and it shows Sending. The other unit displays Exclusive, ECL, showing us that we are, in fact, receiving data. And that takes a few seconds. And then, finally, you see End is displayed on the Source machine. The Slave machine is now ready to play. OK. Well, that's just about all we've got time for. I'm sure you'll agree that the Roland GR30 is an invaluable addition to your guitar rig. And remember that experimentation is the order of the day. So until next time, goodbye.